Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll kick things off in just a minute here. Thanks so much for joining. As we're waiting, feel free to pop in the chat where you're calling in from today. I'd love to hear from you all. Awesome. We got a group from all over the world this morning or afternoon, evening, depending on where you are. Okay, well, we'll kick things off. We've still got some people hopping on, but we've got a lot to cover um, today in this in this great session. So um, I'm gonna kick things off. So as you can see on the screen here, um, we are well underway for our uh, Protect Your Watershed Challenge running from June uh, through July 31st. Um, uh, sponsored by Xylem Watermark, but open to anyone around the world who wants to take part. and we're really pleased to be partnering with the Stroud Water Research Center this year um, on this event. We're learning a ton. This is our second webinar now, um, learning a ton from their experts, um, all sorts of tools and activities that we can do to um, monitor and improve our watershed health. Um, and of course, there are always um, some fun incentives and activities that you can take part in. So um, the, the goal of this two month challenge is really to take action, um, whether it's on land or um, directly in your waterways to um, you know, ultimately have an impact on the health of your watershed, protect our precious water resources um, and make a positive impact. Um, we'd love to see as you take part in these activities this month, if these are just a few of the ideas that, that you can do after you watch this webinar, you, know, you can go out and um, take action yourself. Um, but we'd love to see you post either if you're a Xylem colleague internally to Xylem now or externally on social media, tagging Xylem and the Stroud Water Research Center, hashtagging watershed moment. Um, and um, as always, all the materials that you'll hear about today, the links that you'll see, um, we're gonna be sharing them in the chat, but they're all available um, externally and, and we'll make sure you know how to where to access those. Um, so just before we kick, kick off, I think it's always important to, to answer the question, what is a watershed? Why are we talking about this? Um, a watershed is the, the land area and the waterways that drain into a specific body of water. And so this, this two month period is really a chance for us to take stock of how the actions that we have on land in our everyday life um, have a direct impact on, on the health of our water resources and learn something and, and make a difference. So as we go through the um, this activity today and the others, we have a fun watershed bingo challenge that you all could take part in. Um, if you're every time you do an activity, you can download this and and cross it off, either you know print it out or just do it on a PDF. Cross off the activities you do. If you can get um, five in a row, uh, you'll uh, activate. If you're externally, activate a donation to the Stroud Research Center. And if you're internal to Xylem, you'll um, receive funds on your My Watermark account that you can donate to Stroud or to another um, NGO in, in your community. Um, and if you complete the whole board, you'll get $100 to, to do just that. So it's um, really some, hopefully some good incentive for you to, to get out there. Um, as I said, this is our second um, uh, webinar. We've done one of these leaf pack trainers for our Watermark champions. So thank you to the champions who joined that call um, and got a little bit of a preview of how to run this activity. But this is open to, um, today's session is open to everyone. Um, and it's titled Watershed Wonders, Meet the Teeny Tiny Creatures of Your, of your Stream. Um, and you'll be learning how to um, take part in the Leaf Pack Network. We have recordings available for the past sessions and one more uh, webinar coming up. 
um, later on in July on the 12th. Um, and that brings me to the Stroud Water Research Center. Um, so they are um, a recent partner of the Reservoir Center in Washington, D.C. Um, that Dylan um, is a part of. And so we've been connected through, with them through there, but really found this initiative as a great way to um, kind of advance both, both our missions. So they are a global nonprofit that has led freshwater science for more than 50 years. And they serve as the world's foremost trusted resource on streams and rivers and advancing knowledge and stewardship of freshwater in three key ways, through scientific research, environmental education, and watershed restoration. And all of the Stroud Center's work is in service of how to protect freshwater. Um, so today's session, you'll learn about the leaf pack network. Scientists began deploying bags of dried local leaves into nearby streams as a research tool to measure stream health back in the 1960s. And the online leaf pack network and the commercially available um, leaf pack stream ecology kit that you'll see today bring together backyard researchers and educators around the world. Um, and this network continues to be supported by the Stroud Center. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tara, um, who is going to be leading our presentation today and she'll introduce herself and kick off our presentation. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Emma. Good day, everyone. Happy solstice. And yeah, let me um, share my screen here and we'll get started. Right. So again, um, as Emma mentioned, I'm my name is Tara Mintz. I'm an ecologist here at the Stroud Center and in the education department. I'm also the coordinator of this international program called the Leaf Pack Network. And we're here, she said, for part two of the webinars, um, where part one was a brief introduction, kind of getting some trainers really um, deeply knowledgeable about Leaf Pack. And we're actually going to take an even deeper dive today really into all the foundational pieces, um, background concepts that'll help you understand why leaf pack, why leaves, why streams um, need our attention, and also how you can get started a little bit more as well as just the ABCs of the leaf pack network. Um, leaf pack network is a part of the Stroud Center's award-winning online watersheds um, stewardship toolkit called Wiki Watershed, and you can find that URL at the bottom left corner, and we'll be popping some URLs in the, in the chat for you too. Um, here you'll find the Leaf Pack Network website, which is circled in green, and so many resources here on our Leaf Pack Network website. I'll refer to them kind of over the webinar's time. But there are many other related resources and sites here in our Wiki Watershed Toolkit that will be supportive to you in Leaf Pack Network. And even if you don't get into Leaf Pack Network, these are great tools for you to explore. And one is our associated app called Water Quality, which is there below um, the Leaf Pack site. Monitor My Watershed is the hub for um, the data for Leaf Pack Network. So you can explore other sites and see if there are any in and around near you. And this is a great place to get your data out to the world and the public. And we'll talk about that um, later in the webinar. And lastly, a really amazing site called macroinvertebrates.org, which is, you, you guessed it, a site for identifying macro invertebrates um, focused on the eastern side of North America. But I'll go into this a little bit more about how amazing this site is and as a resource. But a little bit for you to explore later after the webinar. So Leaf Pack Network has been around for over two decades and is an engaging hands-on international what we call biomonitoring program, looking at the biological living organisms in the streams. And this is for all ages and audiences, including teachers and students, families, and individuals wanting to learn more about their local waterways and how to steward them. It was created actually by our former executive director, Dr. Bernard Sweeney, a freshwater ecologist, um, after his eighth grade daughter at that time's teacher inquired to him about how to bring the stream to the classroom because she wasn't able to bring students to the stream on a field study trip. And he said, oh, leaf packs. So it is a professional level monitoring tool simulating what naturally occurs in rivers and streams um, that are surrounded by trees. And he thought that this would be a great way to engage students in a scientific tool, as well as provide a resource for teachers who can't always get students outdoors to a stream. 
We have hundreds of sites around the world now monitoring, and we just switched our database. Um, so you might not see a ton of sites on our database right now, but we have, um, like I said, hundreds of sites around the world that have been with us these 25 plus years. Um, and they're using this as a tool also, not only for monitoring their local waterways, but also to steward them in a way of being that voice of streams and rivers, bringing that underwater world to communities and the public to know about, um, which is really, really amazing. I was a marine sea turtle biologist prior to this life, and um, I had no idea that these stream macroinvertebrates even existed. And it was in my graduate career that I really got to appreciate them more and study them. So again, this is great for all ages. We say K to gray. And you just need to know at what stage of these methods and parts of the program that are appropriate for the age levels that you're interested in engaging. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. So on our website, we have our goals of the Leaf Pack Network, and there are so many. Um, I mentioned a few of these already. And again, this was a program created foundationally for teachers to engage students, but now it's a civic action um, outlet and community science, citizen science outlet. So some of these are geared more for students, but it's applicable for individuals and families and community members. So primarily we're trying to get students and individuals, you know, to investigate their local watersheds, to get even just connected to knowing them, to have a relationship with their local streams in the watershed. And we're doing this with students using these investigative um, outlets and activities that are based in what we call eSTEM, environmental science, technology, engineering, and math. And it's promoting student inquiry. They get to really engage deep in the scientific methods, um, observing and explaining activities and data that they've really connect, collected. It's raising awareness of the importance of really streamside forests to the ecology of rivers and that they are not separate, but they are very connected, um, which many people don't understand the importance of. And to create this diverse and dynamic network of groups around the globe to share rivers, to share the appreciation, awareness, and help others take action for these, these beautiful places. And also provide a actual hands-on way to engage um, people in this, especially for teachers. And there is a kit that I'll go over in just a little bit. So why LeafPack? Um, the feedback that we've received from participants has been really incredible about little particulars of why this network and the approaches that we've taken have been so beneficial. And there are just so many benefits. And one, of course, is that we've aligned it here actually in the U.S. with our next generation science standards, at least for fifth through 12th grade. And across the globe, I'm sure there will be standards that these do meet for you if you're working with students and teachers. Again, we mentioned these are hands-on experiences that are so important for learning um, efficacy, following the scientific methods so you get to actually follow the same procedures that you would as a researcher that we have here at Stroud. And the leaf pack, um, I'll show you that in a little bit, you've seen the leaf pack in some pictures, but is a, what we call maybe a little less harmful or impactful um, method for monitoring streams and rivers where typically someone would get in and in with a net, um, disturb the stream substrate quite a bit. And instead we're placing these packs just in a small little area of the stream and then coming back to retrieve them. So um, a little less impact to the stream bottom. And really emphasizing this terrestrial to water connection, again, that these just aren't separate um, streams and ditches running through the landscape, but they are closely tied, deeply tied to the surrounding land uses. And again, it's a really engaging community science and civic action piece. So we call these meaningful watershed educational experiences and part of that MIWI um, framework, which is developed by um, NOAA here in the US is that there is a civic action piece. And so they not only students and individuals can take information about um, what are signs of impairment or needs for these watersheds and streams, but taking positive action and researching how to do that. 
There are so many stories from around the world of where LeafPAC has made an impact. There are several publications, some in research journals demonstrating the efficacy of not only the learning connections, but real world place-based research that people can engage in with LeafPAC to promote conservation of stream systems. And at the end of the presentation, I'll share a few model examples of groups that are engaged in the program. So let's get back to this. Why leaves and why leaves and streams? Um, I'd like to go into some background ecological concepts that were actually in the first webinar. Um, and these are the foundation of the program but help you understand really the benefits and why leaves matter so much in streams. And we need to start with the streamside forests and the roles that they have in protecting streams in a watershed. Oh, all small streams should be surrounded by trees and other forms of vegetation. And at least historically, most of the Eastern US was densely covered, um, forested, and every stream flowed through these lush forests. And we have seen that change over the past few hundred years with the onset um, of different intensities of land use practices. And it's important to know though that these trees provide many benefits to streams you know, such as protecting the banks from erosion, providing nutrition and energy for the stream and aquatic life within through the shedding of leaves and organic matter. They shade the stream, keeping them cool for certain aquatic life like trout that need cooler streams. And then there's so many more benefits that trees and vegetation provide for streams. So it's a very nurturing relationship and very deeply intertwined and important. So if you think of these trees, deciduous trees, at least here in the U.S. in the autumn here in this region of the world, we witness the shed of leaves carpeting the forest floor. It's just beautiful. After these leaves, though, fall to the forest floor, they're then um, colonized and shredded and decomposed by the FBI. And it's not what you're thinking the FBI is. Instead, the fungus, the bacteria, and the insects. And they produce a very rich soil um, beneath the forest floor. And what happens when leaves though fall into the stream? A similar fate. These leaves collect in fast moving areas called riffles and they tend to gather in packs around rocks and they're colonized and broken down also by the FBI. And this is a time when energy gets released from the leaves in the stream system and something magical happens. So when these leaves start to become slimy with all that fungus bacteria and more, the biofilm becomes present. That's when they become the most appetizing thing on the planet. And they're colonized by macroinvertebrates such as these crane flies, which I call an underwater cow because they love leaves so much. That's the that middle large macroinvertebrate you see there. Also some crustaceans like scuds and then mayflies. And I'm sure you've seen... Um, leaves like this, where they are just skeletons left behind. And that's a good sign that there are these FBI out in the ecosystem. Well, when in the stream, these leaves act similar to a tea and they leach nutrients into the water, maybe influence the color of the stream and becoming watershed or stream tea. Yes, there is a stream or watershed tea in these streams. And the aquatic life within the stream actually consume this watershed tea, which is also a signal to migrating fish where the stream or the watershed tea has a flavor and even smell as a signal of that particular stream. Really incredible. And this watershed tea is what scientists call dissolved organic matter in that pie chart in the blue section. Um, this is the fuel for the stream, the energy, the battery. And for small streams, this dissolved matter or watershed tea is almost half of its energy source and terrestrial big leaves are also another source. And so now we know the importance of forests for streams that leaf packs naturally occur in small streams and provide fuel for streams. And so now let's dive into how we monitor the health of streams with leaf packs. And there are a number of approaches to doing this, um, understanding a stream's health. And some of you may have already engaged in this already. Um, and I make it somewhat, when I explain this, I describe it very similar to you going to a doctor for a health checkup. And that checkup where the doctor looks at you, examines you, they don't just look at one thing. They don't just say, oh, your eyes look amazing. We'll see you next year. 
No, they look at a number of different values and tests and indicators of your health. And we need to do the same for a stream. And so I call some of our scientists here at Stroud stream or river doctors when I'm teaching children. It's a really great way to bring it to them so it's relatable. And our scientists evaluate a stream's health from um, a number of conditions and lenses. Again, not just a single angle, but we typically look at chemical components, which could be thousands of different tests, such as nutrients and heavy metals, pH, and then we also take a look at the physical features of a stream. You know, is there habitat there, such as rocks and roots and woody debris? We look at how fast the stream is moving, how wide is it, what is the color, the odor? These are all signals of the stream's health. And then one of the strongest lit or you know indicators um, are the living organisms or biological indicators, such as fishes and algae, bacteria. And these have all been studied very intensively to know what they're actually signaling, what their sensitivities are. And what we'll be using for leaf pack is this group called aquatic macroinvertebrates. And this is just a fascinating and really incredible group that's been studied for over decades, almost over 100 years as indicators. And we primarily look at them in their larval life stage, but some are also adults. Um, we're looking for a particular group of freshwater macroinvertebrates, the benthic ones that occupy and live in the bottom of a stream. And some of them do live in the middle of the water column and on the surface of the water. But we're focusing on those mostly primarily under the surface of the water and that live in the bottom. And they inhabit freshwater, although they do have some relatives in marine environments. They're relatively easy to see as opposed to microscopic organisms because they you know, but they can be very tiny. They range from as being as tiny as your eyelash to as big as your thumb. Um, so we can use, you know, hand lenses and microscopes and such dissecting scopes to see them a little bit better and, and characteristics of them. But they should be relatively easy to see. And again, they don't have a backbone. So they are invertebrates and they have so many incredible adaptations to keep them um, thriving and reproducing and existing in the stream. And they're good indicators because they are typically very abundant in these ecosystems. They're easily sampled. We know their tolerances to pollution, which are very diverse. And for most of their life cycles, they are constantly underwater exposed to potential pollutants. So again, an incredible resource for us to understand and receive signals about the health of these waterways. Many are known as canaries in the coal mine. They are signals against sentinels of potentially harmful impacts to streams. And we have actually categorized them into sensitivity groups. This is just one um, example of grouping that we have here in the US for all the major taxa, but it really is applicable worldwide. Um, we have the pollution sensitive group on the far left in the blue column there. And you might recognize some of these critters, the mayflies, the stoneflies. We have some types of caddisflies and water pennies. And then on the opposite end of this chart, we have the tolerant group, which can take just a little bit more stress. So these are some of the really tiny ones like uh, midge fly larva, black fly larva, aquatic worms, uh, planaria, the flatworms, and some leeches, and different types of, of snails. And there in the middle of this chart in the purple um, header is the somewhat sensitive group where they can take a little bit more stress, um, but they still need really good conditions. And this is really based off dissolved oxygen and temperatures. So the tolerant group can take a little bit less oxygen, um, lower lo oxygen levels, warmer temperatures, whereas the pollution sensitive, you need really cold, healthy, um, highly oxygenated um, streams and rivers. So keep this in mind as we go through leaf pack because we're going to dive deeper into these sensitivities um, for this the program. And this is really where we come to the message of what leaf pack is telling us. Um, these sensitivities are actually included in what's called a biotic index calculation, which is like a report card for the stream. And there are so many different versions of this. This one in particular for leaf pack is based off the U.S. EPA's um, citizen monitoring protocols. And we 
Um, LeafPak went through a major facelift back in 2000, and we launched a whole new biotic index. So this is different. If you've been with LeafPak for a while, this may look a little bit different to you. Um, but again, this is a biotic index very similar to what the U.S. uses for their citizen monitoring protocols. And it's simply looking at the presence or absence of a taxa group um, as accounted for with a small calculation where you end up finding out what the final rating is here by in the bottom hand right hand corner of rating the stream from poor condition, fair, good, or excellent condition of the stream. And this is really a great, very easy um, calculation that most students can engage in in the public. So now we're going to dive into the leaf pack methods a little bit more. And I first want to note, um, as was mentioned earlier in the webinar, that we have a handy quick guide, which will soon be available on the actual LeafPAC website and also translated into Spanish. So this is really helpful just to dive into it first and get your bearings with LeafPAC and all the, the stages because there are some timeframes to keep note of. There's data sheets to use. There's a lot to keep track of with LeafPAC, but it's a very, um, I feel like very powerful and thorough developed program. And also, we have a great community um, of support. <laughs> we have a lot of videos and tutorials, manuals and guidance that I'll mention here along with our kit. So a lot of support. And then there's me. You can always reach out to me also if you have questions, no matter where you are in the world, um, we can help you. But this website's great. The YouTube station is wonderful, too. We just made a bunch of um leaf pack tutorial videos on the methods, the main stages of the methods. So if you forget something today or need a little bit more information, you can watch these videos on a Friday night, pop some popcorn and enjoy. Um, we also have some great videos on our uh, YouTube station where you can test yourself in macroinvertebrate ID or just get to know a little bit more of the macroinvertebrates. They're called macroinvertebrates in motion. And then we have an e-newsletter that you can subscribe to that goes out a handful of times throughout the year um, with information that, and tools and resources and, and great stories from around the world. So as I mentioned, the LeafPack Network has a kit, um, and this kit is distributed by our, the Lamont Company based out of Maryland, and they actually distribute across the, the world. So LeafPack um, can be brought to you anywhere most anywhere across the country, the world, um, and of course the U.S. And again, we launched a new bilingual version of the kit in 2020s bilingual in Spanish, and includes everything that you would really need to get started, including some special really pieces like sieves and keys, um, sorting pans, hand lenses, and sorting sheets. Everything is made to get wet also and is pretty um, indestructible. <laughs> so it's a great kit. And there are probably pieces of this though that you can find in and around your home, of course. So check those out first. Um, and you can buy individual pieces of the kit also too, if you don't wanna dive right into the whole big kit. But you can find this kit and some information on the resources section of the Leaf Pack Network website. Um, we do have a great manual as well, and that's found free on the website in a PDF form. You get a printed copy in the kit, and also all the data sheets are found on the resources page at the LeafPack website as well. So let me just briefly walk through the methods, and then we'll dive deeper into a bunch of these. But um, just to give you some of the ABCs, um, first, you're going to need to set your goals with LeafPack figure out why are you engaging in this program. There are a lot of reasons we'll go into. You'll select a site that you can access easily. It's usually a small stream with a fast moving area called a riffle. You'll make um, some packs, three to four packs. Um, they have certain weights and you'll typically stuff those with the three dominant native deciduous tree species that you find in and around your stream watershed. You'll place the packs out in the stream underwater for about three to four weeks. So you'll need to keep an eye on your calendar and just make sure that you're available to do that. You'll take some data, complete some forms, and you'll check on those weekly. After that three to four week window, you'll retrieve the packs. You'll bring a bunch of supplies, um, complete some more data sheets, um, and collect more data on retrieving the packs. And then you'll 
either sort those packs um, stream side or bring them somewhere where you can look at the macroinvertebrates and find out what the health is of the stream. You'll complete that biotic index. And then the last step really is to calculate that biotic index and enter and share that data. So those are just a brief overview of all these steps that we're going to go into deeper here. <laughs> Um, before we get into those steps a little bit deeper, let's talk about stream safety and some considerations that you just need to keep in mind when you either are going out by yourself, um, which we suggest you always go out with a, a buddy and let them know where you're, you're going if you are um, engaging in this on your own. Um, make sure that stream is safe, <clears throat> legally accessible, and also safely accessible into the stream so that you have a safe entry point. Um, to get in and out of that waterway. And sometimes you can access these streams in public parks, or if you're working with a school, some schools have streams running through their properties, at least a lot of them do here in Pennsylvania. So um, any needs or questions about that, please feel free to reach out to me and I can help you like look at a map and we can try to do some um, site um, understanding from Google Maps or the Wiki Watershed Toolkit has a lot of tools for looking at your site visually and virtually. Um, look at the stream, you know, surroundings before entering it. Always when you go in, even though you've been into the stream before, sometimes there are, you know, critters and things to be mindful of, like snakes um, and also just plants that might be prickly that you might need to remove and make a safe entry point. Watch out, you know, for changes of weather. We never go out um, if there has been a rise in the stream from a thunderstorm. And also if there's going to be thunderstorms that particular day, we never go out, especially with students. Um, ensure you have proper foot protection. Make sure you're covering your toes. No flip-flops, knee boots are best, or just old shoes or old boots are great. Hiking boots. Uh, we never go out into the stream and monitor when the height of the stream is above your knees. So always lower than your knees is a safe bet to go into. Again, don't go in the water if water levels are rising after a storm or there are known levels of pollution, especially high bacterial levels that come right after a storm. So if you can get on any alerts um, about your stream, sometimes there are known alerts that can be sent out to people about it, or the United States Geological Survey has stream gauges that you can check water levels. And those are on not every stream in the US, but there are on certain streams that might be nearby that you can use as a reference. So, um, and again, make sure you just have plenty of chaperones. Uh, if you're working with students, we usually have one chaperone per 10 students and many eyes, uh, more eyes, the better to help with that. And then lastly, just make sure you have not necessarily as a safety consideration, but just a legal consideration that you have the needed permits to collect and work with aquatic life. Um, every state here in the United States is different. Some are just a fishing license. Some don't need anything. Some require a two to $300 permit because you might be in an endangered species um, stream or a special kind of stream related to releasing of special fishes that are um, have management plans. So just check those things out. And also I'm happy to navigate and look at that with you. All right. So again, first big step of engaging in leaf pack is to find your goals, have clarity on why you're engaging in leaf pack network. Maybe it's simply for outreach and education. Maybe it's to collect baseline data on a local um, challenge that you might have. Maybe you just planted a new riparian buffer along the stream and you want to have monitoring goals for keeping track of, of that. So check those out and just make a plan of where you want the leaf pack data to go in your life because the data can be very powerful um, and especially if you share it. And so that's really, really important to define this and also define your team. Are you gonna have um, community members? Is this gonna be a bigger effort? Are there just gonna be you and a, a best friend that are gonna do this? All of that is perfect. So just clarify those before you get um, started. And selecting your site. So we usually monitor streams here, at least in this part of the country, um, in early spring, and also you can do it in fall. And this relates to the presence and absence um, of the aquatic macroinvertebrates, them and their life cycles, food availability, et cetera. So spring or fall placement is when we encourage um, monitoring these streams. 
And you want to pick a small weedable stream. You don't want a huge, huge river. So these are smaller headwater streams within the watershed. You'll select a reach or a section of stream to work in to do your monitoring. And typically that's a, could be like a 30 meter reach or a hundred foot reach. Um, so you'll want to designate that in your stream that you're going to be monitoring. Again, make sure it's accessible and safe. And we're going to be placing packs in these faster moving areas of the stream that have the highest diversity um, in these rip, what we call riffles. Um, you can place them in runs. We typically do not place them in the deeper pools because they will go anoxic, uh, lack of oxygen, they'll decompose in a different way. So you typically don't find the greatest diversity in those sections of the streams. Making packs. This is the fun part. So um, again, we're simulating what's naturally occurring in stream in autumn. And again, yes, yeah, spring is fine to do this. Um, they, once you put them out, these macroinvertebrates will colonize if they are present. And these stream packs just tend to congregate um, or in the riffles along fast moving rocks uh, where they get kind of pinned. And I don't know if this will show at all, but this is a natural leaf pack that's found in the stream. And again, it's just wedged up against the rock by the fast moving water and macroinvertebrates are able to move in and colonize these packs. So we're just simulating what's naturally found out there, which is really, really wonderful that we can do that. Um, this method, I found out about it when I was doing salamander larval surveys and streams down in the south southern part of the U.S. and um, had no idea that it was a great resource to monitor for aquatic macro invertebrates. Uh, just to note, there is a leaf pack tutorial video specifically on this piece. And you'll make about three to four packs per site. I make a few extra just in case I lose some. <laughs> Um, each pack is going to be maybe 15 to 30 grams. There is a little scale that comes in the kit. And if your stream is very, very shallow because these packs need to be submerged underwater for that three to four week period, um, you can create smaller packs. So they don't have to all be 15 to 30 grams, but that's the typical weight that we have found creates the most diversity. So this is a teacher out in Arizona who just has so many sites that she does with her students and she makes them and stores them. Um, your leaves can be stored for a little bit for a few years if you collect them, but she went crazy on her leaf pack, so it was so fun. <laughs> um, but you want to gather and dry leaves to make your packs. You can gather these in the autumn when leaves are falling here, or you can pull them off of the trees gently, you know, and then dry them. That's fine too. Again, they want to be deciduous or evergreen, uh, native focused, and that's all. Um, you can use, uh, there's an activity that we have in Leaf Pack where you can actually work with students to identify the trees. It's a fun activity where you can just throw kind of like a hula hoop into the forest and they identify what leaves are actually um, on the ground and in the local riparian zone. So that's a great activity. And this is what I do. I collect a ton of leaves in the fall, put them in um, garbage sacks or paper bags and just let them dry for a week or so. It doesn't usually take very long and I separate them out by species. And so when you're making the packs, it's really fun. And, you know, these leaves will um, stick around for a couple of years before they get too crumbly. So you can't use them forever, but you can store them for quite a long time. Making packs is really fun. Again, you take the dry leaves, you'll find these mesh sacks um, in the kit, but you can also reuse lemon or um, lime sacks that you might have that you buy in bulk from the grocery store. You'll need a scale to weigh the packs. There's a new scale I'll show you that comes in the kit. And there are also tags that are waterproof where you can write down the contents of your packs, what the weight is, what the stream name is, and maybe there's a scientist group of students that you want to put your name on there. Um, and then you'll stuff these packs uh, full and just tie them off with one knot. What's fun is that you can do an experiment. So you can also have students or you, if you wanted to try this, where you have your control packs, which are those native three dominant species of tree in your riparian zone or in the watershed, they can also make experimental packs where you put something like non-native or invasive species. You can put plastic bottles in them. You can put evergreens in them and have students do an experiment to see which ones will colonize faster and better. 
So that's an option as well with students. Here's the new scale that comes with leaf pack and it comes with these sorting trays and you just need a cup and you can dry your leaves and weigh them in with this scale also. And if you have an older kit, you can keep using the little postage scale that comes with it. Placing packs. So this again is important where you place three to four and they can all be in the same riffle. Um, I have found a special method to do this that I will recommend because when I first started coordinating this program, I put the packs out. I did it a few different ways and found that I tend to lose them very easily, especially during storms. Um, so I'll go over those methods in just a minute. But these are the supplies that you'll need when you're placing your packs. You'll need the actual packs that you made that have that tag in them to identify what they are. Rebar um, is recommended by me or snow posts um, that you'll pound in the stream and you'll need like a little mallet um, twine that comes with the, the kit, a pair of scissors, the data sheets that are the field data sheets um, where you'll actually take some minor observations like stream temperature, you'll put down some site data and there's a site map page, which I highly recommend that you draw, you know, noticeable, um, identifiable aspects of the stream so you can relocate your packs because over time they are gonna blend in and camouflage really well with that stream. They're gonna get that biofilm growing on them. So I recommend highly that you do a site map and take a, a geolocation if you can of where your, your packs were placed. So, and there's a video that goes with this as well, as you can imagine. <laughs> so we're going to be placing these underwater, and you want to just make sure that they are anchored in. And there are several ways, again, to do this, but these packs need to be, I can't stress enough that they need to be underwater the whole three to four weeks that they are going to be placed in the stream. And again, you don't want them to be bopping up and down in the stream. You want them just to be anchored. And there are several ways to do this. Um, some of our leaf pack participants have um, put rocks inside them. If it's a small stream and they know these rocks will not move with the storm, you can simply do this and lodge them and anchor them down in the stream. You can tie them with twine to an even larger rock and anchor them in that way. My favorite method, which has been tried and true, is to put in a rebar or a snow pool and pound that into the stream bottom and then tie a piece of twine to each pack on the end. And then you just um, anchor or, you know, put the leaf pack in and weigh it down with a rock at the very end. You don't want to cover the pack entirely with a rock. You want to leave some space for water to flow and move through it. But this method has been wonderful. And yes, you'll get some leaves that kind of um, attach to the twine over time, but that's okay. You can remove it just a little bit. So this has been very successful. Um, one of our participants made these lovely signs just to notify people because they place these in a park, a public park, that there is a monitoring, you know, experiment they call that's in progress. They even put a QR code to a website so they could educate people about this in the local community. And this was a great idea um, so that, you know, there's just awareness about what's going on, especially if you place the packs in a public area. After you place the packs, you know, you're again, you're going to wait three to four weeks. You're going to check on them weekly. And in that time frame, you can also complete what's called our habitat survey, which is a four to five page habitat survey that looks about what's available for macroinvertebrates in the stream channel, along the banks of the stream, and also in the local streamside forest, and then watershed wide. You can um, take stream velocity and do a measurement calculation there. Um, looking at the width and the depth and velocity and come up with what's called discharge or how much volume of water is moving in that stream channel. So that's a great activity that you can do in the interim. And you only need to do that maybe once every so many years to do that, but that's a great activity to do with students. 
So mark your calendars, remember, um, come back in three to four weeks, check on those packs and make sure they're underwater and they're doing well. And when you come back to get these packs, you'll need a few supplies. You'll need a bucket to put them into, Ziplocs maybe um, are also an option if you don't have buckets. You'll need a sieve, which helps you to grab that pack out of the water, scissors, data sheets, and a thermometer to also check that water temperature. The one thing with these leaf packs, and again, there's another video, um, is you just you don't want to grab the packs and lift them right out of the water because macroinvertebrates will fall out. You'll want to slowly collect the pack going from downstream to upstream and then place them in a bucket with stream water. You may want to collect a couple extra buckets of stream water for, for sorting. And your sorting, you can do either right there at the stream or you can take the macroinvertebrates um, if you have the right supplies to take them to, say, your garage or a lab or a classroom to do the sorting. And um, this is great to, to remember that, you know, um, macroinvertebrates, you can take them out of the stream, but they always need to be underwater. But this is the, the phase where magical things happen. It's just the best part of the leaf pack process. Again, there are more videos to help you with it. <laughs> um, and so the sorting and ID, again, you can do stream side or right at another site that's local to you. And you'll be um, placing the macroinvertebrates, organizing them, identifying them, and using a lot of different equipment that I'll go over here in just a second. But I want to emphasize the care of macroinvertebrates. So a few things just to note. First, they need to be completely in stream water all the time. You can um, create some extra water to help you uh, by setting out some tap water a couple of days ahead of time. So the chlorination uh, evaporates out. Remember, they do need a lot of oxygen. And that's why we take water temperature when we bring them out so that you can just kind of keep up with the water temperature if you are taking them offsite. Um, and using a bubbler helps with bringing oxygen into the water as well. They need typically, typically cool temperatures, although some streams are getting really warm. Just make sure that you have some ice packs on hand. Um, you can put those in the buckets with the macroinvertebrates. You don't wanna cool it too much, but you wanna make sure that they stay at a similar temperature to what they were in within the stream. Uh, handle them gently using the paintbrush and plastic spoons. I usually don't use forceps or anything when I'm handling these macroinvertebrates with people because they tend to just um, grab onto the macroinvertebrates a little too hard. So just be gentle with them. Uh, transporting them, again, you can use these really great insulated buckets that you see here that come with a bubbler. You can find those at a lot of different um, online vendors and um, bait and tackle shops and such. And then you want to bring these macroinvertebrates back to the stream pretty soon. You know, do not keep them longer than one day. It typically gets hard to maintain because we want to bring them back um, healthy and happy and at least uh, back as soon as possible. So here's a, a setup at the stream and um, we usually use tables and you can use a lot of implements and instructional supplies that come with the leaf pack kit one of which is the sorting sheet that I'm showing here. And it corresponds with the three sensitivity groups. It's really great because you can put Petri dishes on them, fill them with stream water, and then sort the macroinvertebrates according to which category they are in. Um, you'll need a lot of supplies for the sorting. This is probably the biggest piece where you'll just need a, a bunch of things to help you. But notice everything is white when you're working with aquatic macroinvertebrates. <laughs> um, but the kit does come with hand lenses and sorting trays and keys and such. And this is a great way to set up your table just so you have a team that can come do this. And you'll just go through small little pieces of the packs. You'll um, bring the packs out of their bucket, you'll unravel them from the mesh bags. You'll just grab a little small wad of the leaves and put them into the sorting tray, fill it with creek water, and then just find as many of the macroinvertebrates as you can. Again, we're just looking at presence and absence, but you do wanna make sure you go through it. And this stage of leaf pack sorting can take anywhere from one hour to several hours, depending on the health of your, your stream. So you may wanna just make sure you have a good amount of team um, support to go through this phase. So in this phase, you're gonna be diving deep into aquatic macroinvertebrate ID. And I just wanted to share some resources to help you. 
one of which is the dichotomous key that we just created and launched again. And this is bilingual, also in Spanish. It goes over um, most of the terms, um, has size ranges, and it goes, or goes over the morphology or the body parts to look for. Um, because this is a whole new kind of world for some people, this key is really, really supportive to just understanding the, the new body parts and shapes and lexicons and terms to understand. But it goes through the major three sensitivity groups and goes step by step through getting you to a, a good ID on aquatic macroinvertebrates you would typically find in your sample. And it doesn't cover every single of aquatic macroinvertebrate out there. Another great site um, is macroinvertebrates.org. This is wonderful. We co-designed this with Carnegie Mellon University, their um, learning and um, design media team, as well as Clemson University. Um, our staff helped. And these are um, just a focus on this part of North America. But really, if you're going to the order level, which is what we're identifying mostly to some families, this is a great site. It's full of 3D gig gigapan images of aquatic macroinvertebrates where you can zoom right into a tarsal claw or eyeball, learn about their life history. There are videos. And then this site, we also developed a, a free app which is phenomenal. It's my favorite app out there actually on aquatic macroinvertebrates, if not my favorite app ever, <laughs> called Pocket Macros. It's for Android and Apple devices. So um, check that out too. It's got quizzes. You can make um, flashcards for yourself. It's a great way to learn how to see and see to learn aquatic macroinvertebrates. We also have what's called a water quality app, um, also made for Android and Apple devices. And this goes over different um, features of aquatic macroinvertebrates. It has a leaf pack section, so you can enter leaf pack data into it. It's like a digital data sheet, it has learning pop-ups um, about chemistries also, and tells you what um, those levels of certain chemistries and physical tests mean. So check out water quality app. It's a great one to also have to support you with leaf pack. There are also habitat and life cycle flashcards that I won't get into, and also these beautiful blue lenses you can put over to help you see um, over the petri dish a little bit better as well. And then so the last phase we're going to wrap up here is completing that biotic index um, score and entering data into the leaf pack. And so just to review, we're just looking for presence and absence of these three major groups. And in a healthy stream, you're going to expect to find a little bit of every category. Um, in a really impaired stream, you might just find that group three orange tolerant group. Um, so it's it's good to know a little bit background of this, but complete the data sheet will really help you. And again, you'll come up with that final rating of poor, fair, good, excellent. And so over time, as you do this and continue to monitor, you'll gather baseline information and health about your stream. And when I ran a statewide volunteer monitoring program in the southern part of the U.S., our volunteers went out um, three to four times a year to at, at first just to get an idea of what's going on at different seasons in my stream. Um, you don't have to do that. You can just go out one time of year, but it's great to have this baseline information in case anything does pop up as a possible impairment to that local waterway. And so you'll enter your data into our database called Monitor My Watershed. Again, this is part of Wiki Watershed Toolkit. And as you create a login in a group, um, you can keep entering, entering this data over time and you can share it with the world and you can see your data. Um, we have basic um, graphing capabilities here, some inferential basic statistics that will pop up, especially um, with those three sensitivity categories and, and then all the taxa. So it's really wonderful to have some of these um, graphed and statistics held there for you and graphed for you that you can also share with those that are decision makers um, in your local watershed. And if you can't get out to do leaf pack, or if you want to just practice your ID and practice with leaf pack, we actually have a simulation that we've created. <laughs> it's online, it's free, it's really, really amazing and wonderful. And it's a virtual way again to dive into the leaf pack. We have four different stream 
um, examples for you and models that you can do. You can actually perform water chemistries, do a habitat survey, and then you can also identify a sorting tray of macro invertebrates and practice with your key. So this is a wonderful tool, very engaging. It was created for middle school students, but I think it's wonderful for all ages um, to start diving into leaf pack. Okay, to wrap up, just a few more things before we close here. Um, just some teaching and monitoring examples that are from around the world, if you're interested. Um, this, these teachers from this middle school here in Pennsylvania are just incredible. They've been doing this for three years in a row, doing leaf pack with their gifted and talented, talented, talented students. I can't say that this morning. Um, Stroud has two to three interactions with them. So this is just an example of how you could go about this if you're interested in working with students or you're a teacher yourself. Um, our first interaction was an introduction to leaf pack, watersheds, macroinvertebrate ID, um, rolling around a, a local creek to them called Trout Creek. They were practicing also ID kind of in the interim of those interactions with me. So I came in person with them, did a, a brief introduction, walked them through how to identify macroinvertebrates. They then practiced, got a lot of experience with macroinvertebrates.org. And then the culminating last event is that we brought the macroinvertebrates from the stream to them. And they sorted and ID'd into the biotic index and some meaning making pieces about what they could do to maybe do some particular outreach and education about appreciation, appreciating this local creek. We did this in spring, um, whatever it fit into the teacher's schedule before they had their testing. And they entered their data into the Monitor My Watershed um, database. So their data is available and ready to share. And they're going to be working on communication pieces that the students can do to share the data. I won't go over all these, but there are so many student objectives that Leaf Pack does hit, as well as um, standards with NGSS that you can check out. These are on our website. And we also have a video of several different um, teachers and professors from all over the world that do share their experiences, their tips of working with students and engaging learners in Leaf Pack Network. So this is on our YouTube station. Um, one of the last groups I'm going to share is working with our um, local First Nations people, the Lenape Indian Tribe of Delaware in particular, where we worked with uh, Chief Dennis Coker and some tribal members on a project with National Geographic, where our main goal was to understand if their local tribal watersheds could support the survival and reproduction of freshwater mussels. And freshwater mussels are in leaf pack, and they are one of the most endangered and impaired and threatened um, faunal groups in freshwater systems. And they have a very complex life history. And so we are using leaf pack to understand this model of their needs. And it was incredible. We, we took um, water quality information. We did bird surveys. We did other types of surveys, but leaf pack was an integral piece of their monitoring, which started last year. And we presented these results actually in several capacities. Um, it's on the website. You can look at their data. And um, we have now 14 sites. This is just the first half of the 14. Um, that's me with Chief Coker, where we had a public day. We brought our watershed education mobile lab and had the public actually help us identify and, and learn about these macroinvertebrates and shared information about restoring the tribal watersheds there in the state of Delaware. Uh, the ACR Foundation is about Amazonian conservation education and uh, research, environmental research, and they have been doing leaf pack for a very long time, actually since probably the beginning of the leaf pack kit. They've been doing research in their local watersheds. Um, and they recently completed a huge study on the Transoceanic Highway from Puerto um, Malonado to Cusco to assess the impact of road construction on aquatic biodiversity. And they have published um, on this research and it's really helped be, to be a very strong component of protecting local waterways down there as well as citizen science programs through their program called Amigos. Um, and they have brought this into a university level. They've identified more aquatic macroinvertebrate species that were not known before. So um, they have a great website if you're wanting to learn more and to reach out to them as well. So I will wrap up here. Sorry, we didn't have time to go into identifying an aquatic macroinvertebrate, but I will take any questions if there are any. And thank you so much for being here. <laughs>
And that's my information. Please feel free to reach out anytime if you have questions or want some advice on how to get started or site questions or anything like that. Thank you, Tara. Let's see if we have any questions coming in. All right, not seeing any questions yet, but a lot of thank yous for a great presentation. And folks, you have um, her email and you can always reach out as well if, um, uh, yeah, you have any other questions. It is recorded. So this will be posted both to YouTube on the Stroud Water Research Center's YouTube channel and internally to our Xylem platforms on Xylem Now. Um, okay, I see a question from Kevin Warren. What role do you see for watershed associations? Um, would would you organize it and bring it to a local teacher? I, I think that's the question. I, I'm not sure if I totally understood you, Kevin, if, if maybe you can clarify a bit. Yeah, and I can just start into it. Watershed, yeah. local watershed organizations are amazing to support this. Um, and sometimes they have their own methods, whether they follow maybe the country's methods or the state's methods or um, their own developed methods and design methods. Here in the state or the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we have probably 10 different methods that people are following, um, but it's all important about following that method, continuing with it, and then finding that outlet for your data to be um, shared. And, you know, it all depends upon your goals of where you want that research and data to go. But watershed organizations are great to actually make that connection with local schools and to provide support if you want to engage a local school. Yeah, we've done that a lot. We bring in watershed organizations for support to help because when it comes to the sorting part, you need all hands on deck to help with that piece, especially with students. So the more, um, the better. And high school students can also help maybe middle school students. Um, and you can find volunteers also to help with that piece. So hopefully that was helpful. Awesome. Thank you. That's great. I stunned everybody, I know. <laughs> um, the One of the questions is, do the resources include a lab report form that students can fill out? Well, we don't have like necessarily like a lab report form, but there is an experimental separate type of data sheet that you can use if you do um, make your packs more of an experimental piece instead where you um, put in, like I mentioned, stuffing them with plastic or um, evergreens or non-native species. So a report though um, would be a great addition. So I will put that on my list to create. Thank you for that idea. Awesome. All right. Well, I really look forward to seeing um, our Xylem colleagues and, and partners out there taking part in this um, awesome activity and can't wait to see pictures and results. So um, Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the Stroud Water Research Center and, and you, Tara, for a great presentation today. We'll, we'll let you all go. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Bye.